surprised reporters by stopping to talk with with them at the entrance to White House Chief of Staff John Kelly's office. And after a few questions about uh, international trade and immigration, the president was asked about the special prosecutor's investigation. This Are you going to talk to Mueller? I'm looking forward to it, actually. You yeah. want to? Do you have a date Here, here's set? Here's the story, just so you understand. Set, There's Mr. been president? no collusion whatsoever. Yeah. There's no obstruction whatsoever. And I'm looking forward to it. I do worry when I look at all of the things that you people don't report about with what's happening. If you take a look at, you know, the five months worth of missing texts, that's a lot of missing texts. And as I said yesterday, that's prime time. So you do sort of look at that and say, what's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, you do look at certain texts where they talk about insurance policies or insurance, where they say the kinds of things they're saying. You've got to be concerned. But I would love to do that. Uh, I'd like to do it as soon as possible. When, when will Good you luck, do it, everybody. Mr. The president then tried to pull away since one question about Robert Mueller is more than enough for Donald Trump. But NBC's Kristen Welker and other reporters quickly followed up and the president kept talking. Kristen Welker asked, when, when is the president going to talk to the special prosecutor? Do you have a date set, Mr. President? Uh, I don't know. No, I think yes, they're talking about two or three weeks, but I would love to do it. Would you do in person? You know, again, it's, I have to say, subject to my lawyers and all of that, but I would love would to do it. Would you do it under oath, Mr. President? You mean like Hillary did it under? Who said that? Oh. I said that. Oh. Did you do it under oath? Uh, oh, you said it. You did say it. You say a lot. Did Hillary do it under oath? I have no idea, but I'm not asking. Uh, I think you have an idea. Do you Don't you have an idea? Do you think you'll wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Do you not have an idea? Uh, do you really I, not have an idea? I don't remember. I'll give you an idea. She didn't do it under oath, but, but I would do it under oath. Listen, but I would do it, and you know she didn't do it under oath, right? She would do it under oath. If you didn't do it, if you didn't know about Hillary, then you're not President, much of a reporter. So you're going to do it under oath? Say it. To reach a higher standard, you would do it under oath. Oh, I would do it under oath, yeah. Absolutely. Do you trust no, I would do it. And, of course, the president's lawyer, Ty, Ty Cobb, almost immediately took all of that back, saying that the president was speaking hurriedly, uh, that was his word, hurriedly, and only intended to say that he was willing to meet with the special prosecutor if that can be negotiated by the lawyers. Joining us now, Tim O'Brien, the executive editor of Bloomberg View. He's the author of Trump Nation and an MSNBC contributor. Also with us, Jill Weinbanks, former assistant Watergate special prosecutor and an MSNBC contributor. And Natasha Bertrand, staff writer at The Atlantic. And, and Tim, I just want to start with you because uh, you were sued by Donald Trump. So you know Donald Trump as a, uh, a real estate businessman in New York who you wrote a book about. You know him now as as a politician, you know him as president, but you know him as a litigant. You know him as Donald Trump under oath in depositions in your case. Uh, what did you hear tonight uh, when you were listening to Donald Trump say, uh, sure, I'm happy to do it, I'm happy to do it under oath? Yeah, and I think he said, I'll, I'll also do the whole lawyer thing. And then at some point tonight, Ty Cobb said, and of course he won't do anything without the advice of his counsel, which of course isn't true. Donald Trump does everything without the advice of his counsel, which is why he is such a nightmare client for attorneys. And our experience of him during litigation, we deposed him for two days. Uh, my attorneys were former federal prosecutors of the Mueller School, and they destroyed him during that, that deposition, Lawrence. He, he wasn't prepared. Uh, he went off message. Uh, during the course of two days, they caught him you know, admitting to 30 lies uh, around everything uh, involving his his wealth, his debt, how much is his condominium sold for. Um, he is about the worst person you can sit down under oath because he is congenitally unable to tell the truth often. He's prone to hyperbole. And um, he doesn't really think strategically. He thinks about self-aggrandizement rather than thinking about the truth or trying to arrive at a strategic goal in the litigation. Natasha Bertrand, uh, the, surely the White House lawyers, the Trump lawyers, know about his case with Tim O'Brien and how terrible he was as a witness. And they must be impressing upon him that this is different. This is not a civil matter. Uh, this is criminal. These are the best uh, lawyers you've ever faced in your life. Uh, and the stakes have never been higher. And therefore, you, our client Donald Trump, must, must behave differently than you did in, in the Tim O'Brien case. Any indication that that's getting through to Donald Trump? 
No, it's it's clearly <laughs> not working. I mean, he's still tweeting, and if he's this easily baited by reporters into talking about an ongoing investigation for which he's going to be interviewed by special counsel Robert Mueller within the next two to three weeks, then what's it going to be like when he's sitting in front of Mueller, who's an extremely experienced prosecutor, extremely experienced um, in criminal um, prosecutions, when he has to, when he's presented with questions that Robert Mueller already knows the answers to? Is he going to be tricked by Mueller into incriminating himself? These are all questions that I'm sure the White House is really, they're really worried about because Donald Trump has approached this entire investigation with a degree of carelessness that would make any lawyer kind of shiver. And uh, Jill Weinbeck, uh, the president was correct there when he said that Hillary Clinton was not under oath. She wasn't given an oath when she was interviewed by the FBI. Uh, but a couple of things. My understanding is that that's standard procedure for that kind of interview. They don't put them under oath. But lying to an FBI agent is a federal crime. So is this an academic distinction, uh, whether you're under oath or not in those interviews? It is a difference without distinction. It is a felony to lie to the FBI just as much as it is to lie to the grand jury. One is perjury, one is a false statement. They're different statutes, but they have criminal consequences. So it doesn't matter whether he's under oath, it's just a PR stunt on his behalf. And Jill, in your experience, uh, when, when you deal with uh, people under oath, who've, whose experience is limited to civil cases like Donald Trump, uh, do, do, do you feel sometimes that they believe they, they have enough experience because they've been in civil cases uh, to deal with prosecutors' questions? I think it is different in a criminal case than in a civil case, but in his case, every lawyer I've ever talked to who has had him in a deposition says that he is really a bad witness. And just judging from how I've seen him on public media, he is a nightmare for a, a, a lawyer. He would be a very bad client. He does not listen to lawyers' advice. And I think he will get himself into a lot of trouble. And I think he may underestimate how much Mueller already knows, what mm -hmm. documents, what emails, what uh, phone calls he's been told about. And he may get trapped into saying something that he wants to be true, but that is inconsistent with all the evidence that is already in the possession of the Mueller investigators. Uh, let's listen to what the president said uh, tonight when he was asked, do you trust the FBI? Do you trust the FBI? Well, we're going to see. I mean, I am very disturbed, as is the general, as is everybody else that is intelligent. When you look at five months, this is the late, great Rosemary Woods, right? <laughs> With a step, right? This is a large-scale version. 18 minutes. This is, that was 18 minutes. This is five months. Uh, they say it's 50,000 texts, and it's prime time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's disturbing. Yeah. Do you say think hello to your Should McCabe go? Should McCabe go, Mr. President? Should McCabe go? Well, McCabe got more than $500,000 from essentially Hillary Clinton. And is he investigating Hillary Clinton? Uh, Natasha, do you want to try decoding that? Well, there were a number of really important factual inaccuracies in what he said. First of all, it wasn't 50,000 text messages that went missing. It was text messages that were, went missing from many, sev sev several thousand cell phones across federal agencies because of a switch from iPhone to Samsung. It was a glitch that affected several agencies, so not just the FBI. So it's not some grand conspiracy theory by which the Bureau is trying to hide these text messages from the public. And the second mistake, obviously, is that Andrew McCabe was not the one who received $500,000 from Terry McAuliffe. It was his wife who was running for Virginia State Senate seat. And his wife, of course, ended her campaign month, months before McCabe was even appointed deputy director of the FBI, months before he even assumed an oversight role onto the Hillary Clinton email investigation. So this is more of an attempt by Trump to kind of discredit the FBI and thereby discredit the entire investigation into his campaign and whether he obstructed justice.
Uh, and Tim, of course, there was a reach back to the Nixon administration and the famous 18-minute gap uh, on the, t the uh, Nixon tapes. Uh, and Rosemary Woods, uh, the president's uh, secretary at the time, was considered the prime suspect for that. And that's the kind of footnoting you have to do when Donald Trump is uh, on a rant about uh, Andrew McCabe. And uh, the question there of uh, should McCabe go uh, the president ducked to that, but he did try to, as uh, Natasha says, uh, sign this political contribution to McCabe when, in fact, it was to his wife and it had happened long before any of this. Well, you know, one of the things going on here, Lawrence, is that you've got the president of the United States, the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, willy nilly trying to impugn the reputations of career law enforcement officials who I think regard themselves as straight arrow civil servants who are part of institutions that we have valued for a long time in this country about upholding the rule of law. And throughout the Mueller investigation, at almost every turn, you have the president trying to undermine the reputation of almost everyone who's touched this investigation, from Bob Mueller to Jim Comey, now to Andrew McCabe, solely because I think He's worried and he's aware of the gravitas of the situation that he's in. And he will pull out all the stops he can to try to impugn the credibility of everyone involved in it. Uh, let's listen to the president uh, answering the question, uh, did he ask Andrew McCabe who he voted for? Did you ask who he voted for? You know, I know. How did much you is... Ask, did you ask how much McCabe did you ask who he voted, voted for? for? Did you ask him that? I don't think so. No, no. You don't think you no I don't think I did. You don't. You did not. I don't know what's the big deal did? with that. Because no, I, I would ask you who you who did you vote for? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Should it's a big deal. But I don't remember that. Oh, you know, I saw that this morning. I don't remember asking him that question. Is it possible you did? Is it, is it I don't remember asking him the question. Do you think Robert Mueller? I think it's also a very unimportant question. Okay. But I don't remember asking him that question. Uh, Jill, if Andrew McCabe tells the special prosecutor that the president asked him that question uh, and then the president gives this answer that you just heard him give to the special prosecutor, how do you think that will fly? I think that anybody listening is going to believe Andrew McCabe's version that he was asked it. And the denial is a pretty weak denial. It's, well, I don't remember asking it. He's not saying he didn't. Uh, but I also want to just make one reference to Rosemary Woods because <coughs> as the prosecutor who questioned her, I just want to point out that there was a deliberate erasure of 18 minutes. There was not something that happened because there was a switch from iPhones to Samsung. That's an accident. <laughs> this was, there were eight separate erasures. We know that for sure. That is a deliberate erasure of evidence. This was an accident that affected many agencies and that it is despicable that the president is demeaning the FBI who are very hardworking serious people who take their job seriously and seek to do justice and get the facts out regardless of their own perspective. So I'm really sad that that's happening. Uh, Tim, uh, since you know uh, Trump uh, better than uh, anyone here, I, I want to go back to this issue of Trump's lawyers trying to prepare him for what he's really in for here. Did you hear in, in uh, the president's manner tonight or his tone uh, uh, the, anything that indicates he understands the seriousness of what he's involved in? No, no, I, I don't think he understands it at all, Lawrence. There's, there's a, a freight train headed towards him right now. and. When you prepare a witness to sit down with someone uh, like Bob Mueller, you have binders full of documents that you are expecting your client to go through to prepare for an event like that. It requires a lot of patience and discipline. It requires someone who actually is an active and engaged reader who can retain information and can think about achieving a strategic goal. None of that applies to President Trump. He's not a reader, he's impatient, he won't be well prepared uh, for this. And the other thing they really don't understand is it's ultimately not up to him and Ty Cobb to, to decide the terms of engagement on this one. If, if they won't comply, ultimately Bob Mueller can subpoena Trump and put him in front of a grand jury. I don't think anyone wants it to go there. But most of the leverage in how this will go down is in Bob Mueller's hands. Tim O'Brien gets the last word in this segment. Tim O'Brien, thank you very much.